Um, so yeah, my name is Ellie Kennedy. I'm from Northern Arizona University. And I did an IBL class for the first time in last semester. So this was the spring semester. Um, and I just wanted to share with you kind of some of the insights that I had, some of the things that I still have questions on, and then some of the things that really I thought worked well. Um, so I taught two sections of discrete mathematics. Um, there were about 25 students in each section, which was amazing, especially for it being my first time with an IBL. Um, this is not normal for our university. Mostly our classes are more in the 30 to 40-ish students, so it was great that I had so few students. Um, the topics in our discrete math are the counting principles, induction, recursion, and graph theory. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do something different was because of the counting and the induction. When I taught this class before and lectured, um, I bored myself with the like counting and induction. I just felt like I was lecturing something over and over and over again and lecturing something that the students could do themselves with a little bit of a push. Um, and so I, I really wanted something, something different. Um, so I got notes from Ted Mahavier. These were unrefereed notes. Um, and in general, the notes were, were really great. It had counting, induction, and graph theory. Um, the counting was fantastic. The induction, I had to make a little bit of modification. He focuses on strong induction, and our course it focuses on weak induction, so I had to make a little adjustment there. Um, and the graph theory was great. Um, I added the recursion section to the notes and, and I learned a lot of things about IBL and about especially in making the notes and how difficult it can be. Um, so here's some things I learned about the notes. First of all, confusing questions are good. When I was first going through Ted's notes and going through the problems myself, I would hit problems and be like, what is he, what kind of a question is this? It makes no sense. I don't even know exactly how to answer this. And I went with it for the most part and it ended up being really good. And what I realized is that there were ingrained within these problems a thought of the a question that the students wanted to ask the presenters. Um, and so I guess I should also back up and say a little bit about how I, how I did all this. I would have the students work through, say, 10 problems at night, come into class and present those problems to, to the rest of the students. Um, I sat in the back and tried to say as little as possible. And that's pretty much how, how every day went. Um, so as far as those confusing questions, I feel like there, it promoted really good conversation when there was something missing from them, when they weren't specifically clear. But I think that would take a lot to actually create questions that would create problems that would create questions. Um, I had a hard time with that recursion section because to me solving recursive relations is a very algorithmic process. And so it was very difficult for me to write the notes and I would have had to go back to how the algorithm was developed and maybe try to get the students to develop that algorithm and it, shorts, it showed a lack of, of my knowledge, um, I, I feel like, in, in developing that. Um, what I did is I did some videos that I put online for that and almost did a little bit more of a flipped classroom with that section because um, it wasn't going so well with me just writing, writing the notes for that. Uh, the felt tip pens. I don't know. Dana, was this your original idea or did you steal it from somebody else? Sort of stole it. Okay, it's fantastic. Um, so this is something that worked out really well. So like I said, I had the students go home and work on problems, come to class and present them. So when they worked on the problems, they did it in pencil or a couple of them in pen. And then in class, I had them write only in felt tip pen. So I just had a box, they came into class, picked up a pen and sat down and started writing with the pen. So when students did presentations, they were making a solution set, but with the felt tip pens. Um, so when grading, I would give them a check or check minus, a check or a check plus, depending on how much math they had produced before they came to class. So it wasn't whether they were right or wrong, and they loved that. 
that they could just work on the problems freely without having the pressure of like, did I do this right? And being okay with coming to class and then figuring out how it was gonna be done right um, by, by having a student present it. Um, and my only hesitation on it was I was wondering if, whether it would work whether all students would follow through with it. Um, and it took, I think maybe twice I noticed, because I sat in the back and kind of noticed <laughs> what students were up to. Um, and I noticed students not using felt tip pens and I think it just took mentioning it and just saying, hey, here's one, make sure you use this in class every day. Um, and they did, they all used them. I didn't have any issues with you know, them using pencil or anything else in class. The grading was easy um, and they really got a lot out of it. Um, so some notes on the in-class experience. I feel like the first day is so important with presentations. The first day of presentations is important. Um, gaining a comfortable classroom where students are okay making mistakes, um, that is a difficult thing to do um, and making students comfortable with presentations. Um, so for the presentations, I know the, the last, where is she, the last speaker, um, was, <laughs> was asking about some ideas on the presentations, what I did, um, and it seemed to work pretty well. Um, I asked for volunteers, I kept a tally only of presentations, not of questions, um, and whoever had the lowest presentation score was chosen. So I would ask for volunteers, a few people would raise their hands, I'd do a tally, you have the lowest, you go up. Um, and um, and that, worked, that worked really well. Um, I, I don't like calling on students either. I, I didn't like it as a student, so I, I'm not a fan of that. Um, but I think making the presentations comfortable was a big deal. And I made a big deal out of the first time that a student does a problem wrong. Um, and this happened at the perfect timing in the class. It was the, at the end of the first day of presentations. And he did the problem so very, very, not much was right in there. Um, and the students have a hard time saying, um, and speaking up and saying, look, I, I, I don't think you're right at all. Like that's a really difficult thing to do. And it was so perfect that I had to wrap up the class anyways. So I could go up to the front and be like, well, let's talk about what is right in here and what you can move on with and what's wrong and spent like a minute doing that and then just said, this really is not right. Um, I want you all to go home and think about this problem and then we'll do it again tomorrow. Um, and, and then I thanked the student very much for being wrong and said how important it is to come up to the board and do wrong solutions and that as a class we will learn more by those mistakes than we'll learn from actually having a correct solution on the board. Um, productive arguing, this is something I struggled with. Um, I called it arguing because there really was some arguing that would happen um, between different students of saying, no, I'm right because, and no, look at this definition. And um, there's a point when I would have to stop it, and that, is, that was a difficult decision sometimes for me to make of exactly when to stop that arguing and either give a hint and then send them home to think about it again, or do I stop, clarify, and and just clarify and end the argument right there. Um, it's also hard for the students because they don't like being confused and they don't understand that it's good um, for them to be confused um, and they don't understand that it can be okay to be confused for days. And that's another thing that I just talked a lot about in class that math isn't something that in this day and age with computers, we get the answer right away. We just open up Google and bam, there it is, Wikipedia. And students really want that answer quickly and it's hard to make them okay with the fact that it's, it's okay to think about it for days or years. Um, and maybe in the context of this class until the exam, but, um, but it's, it's okay to think about it for days. And I just kept trying to remind them that it's okay to be confused as long as it becomes clear at some point. Keeping my mouth shut, this is hard. This was really hard. Um, and I did okay until induction. And this was the first time that most students had seen proofwriting in my class. And I wanted them to gain a level of detail in the grammar of the proof. And because most of them had not seen proofwriting, they weren't speaking up 
to the other students. And so I started talking a lot more in that section, um, and then I had to make a big point of really on the next section after that proofwriting, stepping back again um, and trying to keep my mouth shut again. It's really, it's really difficult. Um, I, I still have a very hard time keeping my mouth shut in class. This was an interesting insight in the class. So I had a student that struggled all semester. Um, he was the only student that ended up failing the class that didn't withdraw. There were students that withdrew. Um, but I only had one student fail. Um, and it was in one of the review sessions that I actually sat down with him and was working through a problem and realized he was just trying to jump to the end every time, just jump to the end and not follow through. And he, he had no process in his head of how to even start to problem solve. And so I told him that he needed to write down step by step for this problem, like go home, write on a note card, step one, step two, here's what I do. And he was like, like a map. I was like, yes, exactly, like a map. And this made me realize a couple things. Um, first of all, in lecturing, that's what we do. We create a map. We say, start here, follow this path, and you're gonna get to this end point. And Really, with IBL, we're sort of throwing them the cities and the states and then say, here, go connect these yourself. And that's such a different process for students. And I, that is where most of them really struggle. Um, and, and, and I struggle in trying to figure out, especially with a student like him that struggled all semester. Every student struggles with it at first. And then they'll figure it out on how to figure it out but he never did, and I, don't, I still don't know the answer of how to help him in, in figuring out how to map. Um, so that was just an interesting insight. Um, some other overall perspectives. Um, the student assess, the self-assessment of the homework went fantastically, and by the self-assessment, I mean that they went home, they worked on the problem, they came to class and were shown a solution right or wrong sometimes, but eventually we got it right. And, and in that, just knowing whether they got it wrong or right. Um, and they really liked it. The pressure was off as far as the homework went. Um, they, they could do, as long as they worked on the problem at home, it was, it was great and participated in class. Um, the writing exams to me seemed really difficult. And maybe this was because the students were self-assessing. Maybe it's because it wasn't that lecture, what I call like regurgitation math, where you give them the map, you show them what to do, and then they, they regurgitate it on the exam. Um, and I, I, still, I still have a very hard time writing the exams. And I, I did, I really struggled with writing the exams for the semester. Um, I have what I think is a fantastic idea, at least it worked really well for the final exam, um, but this would only work in specific, in specific classes. Um, so what I did is I, I gave the students a list of topics, and it would be fantastic in a class if you could make the students come up with their own list of topics for the entire semester. Um, and then I, for each different topic, broke down what type of a problem I wanted them to write. So for induction, say, I would have them write four different induction problems. One where the answer required words only, one where it was algebra, one with an inequality, and one with like exponents. Um, four different problems with the solutions worked out, or maybe um, I would have them do like an easy, a medium, and a hard um, solving a recursive relation, something like that. Um, and so those were kind of some ideas of like the topics and, and what I would ask them to do. So they wrote down the problem, the solution to it, handed it all into me. I scanned them. I posted them online. It was their review, and then I picked problems from that for the final. It ended up being 90 pages of problems. It was huge. With the, I, I combined the 50 students' work. Um, and so it was a huge amount of problems. I didn't look at it for correctness. Um, I had to email students back and forth a little bit on, oh yeah, this one does have kind of a big mistake that everybody needs to know about. Um, but in general, they loved it. It went fantastically. Um, but again, I don't think it would work for every class. I think that writing the problems themselves requires a level of math, 
and a different way of thinking that for higher level classes is great to make them do. Um, I don't think I'd try it in Calc 1. Um, it's hard to convince students that being confused is okay. Talked about this a little bit. Um, and that just took constant, constant telling them that they were doing great. Um, and that although they felt like they were confused most of the time, when it got to the exam, they were, I, and it's, this is a true statement, they were doing better than classes had previously done for my classes um, on the exams. And so I think it just took that reminding that even though they were confused, they were actually learning more than if I was just telling them how to do, how to do the problems. Um, but I, that, that I, I definitely said that quite a lot <laughs> in class. Um, and so lastly, I have some of the student comments um, that I, I took out. I left all student comments in here. Um, that, and I took out the ones that didn't refer to the method at all. But otherwise, they're all in here. So good or bad. I just wanted to warn you, there's some bad ones like this one. Um, Ellie didn't think that lectures would be effective as the students teaching themselves, and I disagree. She's an amazing instructor, but lectures always help. Um, this is my favorite one. Certainly showed respect for the students and encouraged us to fail early and often, and this is a good thing. I, I just want to put that like on my office door. <laughs> I, that's my favorite one. <laughs> um, this one I know is long, but it actually has some, some decent things to say. I um, really enjoyed the way the class was structured with students presenting their solutions to problems to the class because I believe very strongly that you do not truly know a subject until you can explain it to someone else. When you made a mistake, there was usually a discussion about it that led to understanding of the concept, which also shows how much better you can learn from your mistakes rather than just repeating information. The structure of the class, I believe, also helped the students be able to talk to anyone in the class more easily. Then I loved the idea for students to write exam problems themselves for that last homework assignment. Um, I was not optimistic about the format of the class, but I liked it a lot. It was a different way to learn, but it worked. Having, uh, having to present questions and prepare answers gave me the ability to understand hard topics and develop my abilities of exploring problems and trying to search for answers. That was another good one. Um, I actually have a few more, but I think I'm going to leave it, I think I'm going to leave it there. So thank you guys very much. Yeah, I do have time for questions. Mary Lucas, <laughs> retired, non-practicing mathematician. I think it's one of the most important presentations that uh, I've been to in all these 17 years. And I'll focus on it's okay to be confused. I have been confused most of my life. <laughs> the most recent example was in this plenary session when they put that first problem up there. <laughs> they said something about an equation. And I thought to myself, why am I confused? The reason I was confused because there was no equation in that problem. And that led me on to trial and error. But what I, the point I want to make is that not only is it okay to be confused, but the first thing to do when a person is confused, and if you could make this point to your young new, student, new teachers particularly, first thing to do is nothing. Just like it's very difficult to not say anything, <laughs> it's very difficult to not do anything. And so I, I did nothing when I saw that, and then I started rereading it. Then reread the thing, reread it. So a lot of this basic mathematics is really English. And the importance of language, the old timers here will tell you about the importance of language. So if you're accurate in language, which I'm not either much, that will lead me maybe to think a little clearer. Great to be here, great session. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is Lee Mahavior Peterman, the sister of the person that gave you the notes. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to comment that as a new IBL person, you really got 
the crucial parts of it. Good job. Thank you. There's a, a lot of the elements of IBL, but you, you, got, you got the good ones. And the other comment I had was, um, trust yourself with the uh, make your own exam. I've done it with ninth graders. Okay. It, it works. It's okay. A, it's, a, it's empowering. Mm -hmm. And you gave them a very detailed template. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really work when you just say get in groups. And, mm -hmm. But you give them a template, yes, okay. they can do it. I'll try it in Calc 1. I'm Dan Goldner. Um, I'm guessing that you're already, like, starting to think about your next IBL course and what you're going to do of the course. same and different. And, yeah, so can you, <laughs> can you comment a little bit about what's next based on this experience? Uh, <laughs> um, I definitely uh, want to teach sequences and series um, with IBL in Calc 2. Um, I've taught Calc 2 in a completely flipped classroom, and I don't think it's completely successful. I think that there were times that I actually need to lecture. Um, uh, and sequences and series is one of those times that I still not sure lecture is the best way. Um, I, and I d flipped classroom is not the best way. And so I, I think I might try IBL. It'll be interesting because it's only partway through the semester. Um, and so how to get my, my task will be how to create that group dynamic uh, if I don't do it right away the, f the first couple days. Um, I mean, I'll have to do it the first couple days, but then how do you keep it when I don't, when I do, am gonna flip sometimes and lecture sometimes, and so that's part of it. And then um, I'm teaching a Calc 1 class also in the fall. I have no idea what I'm doing with that yet, but I'm sure there'll be some IBL, if not all, involved. I don't know, that's a big question mark in my mind. Probably depends on who I can steal notes from for Calc 1. Uh, Ed Parker, retired from James Madison University and more recently Guilford College. Uh, your, your question is about assessment. This is more of a comment than a question, but uh, it may well be helpful if you can escape the image of a test being a test and phrase it in terms of two questions. Can they do what I think they can do? Because you've seen them do. And then what else do I need to know? And uh, you may have one question that's for one student, and you really don't care what the rest of them do on it. Right. Because you need to know whether that student can do that because what they've done hasn't shown you. And can they do what I think they can do just reinforces what you already suspect of the right assessment uh, level. So uh, those two questions really narrow it down rather than I've got to test this part of the curriculum, I've got to test this part of the curriculum. Uh, if you can get out of that mindset, you can really leverage the advantages you've given yourself by seeing them think every day. Yeah, cool, thank you. Uh, did you see or did you observe that uh, you became more, uh, I'm Hussein Al-Turki from uh, University of Oklahoma. Did you notice that you became more lenient in grading and assessment? Uh, I've tried IBL this summer session and I feel uh, more guilty since it's not a structured class. So I tend to be more easy on them when I'm grading. Do you feel that's happening with you? I, I because I have, um, I did a pretty big study on the flipped classroom and had kind of this issue with the assessments and really tried to put it into perspective when I was grading the, the flipped versus not and wanting it to succeed. Um, and I, I really try to focus on not doing that. Um, and in fact, I know I gave them harder exams than I had in the past. <laughs>